Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. My name is Tony Cully Foster. I'm President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C. On behalf of the Council, I welcome you to tonight's Author Series program. First of all, many thanks to our strategic partners at the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center for their wonderful hospitality and for providing us with a beautiful venue to hold our public programs. They are filmed for nationwide broadcasts on our television show, World Affairs Today, which airs weekly at 3 p.m. on Sunday afternoons on MHC Network's Worldview channel. They are also distributed globally on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and other digital platforms. We're very fortunate that today's event will focus on Ambassador James Dobbin, the author of the book Foreign Service, five decades on the front line of American diplomacy. Ambassador Dobbins is currently a senior fellow and distinguished chair in diplomacy and security at the Rand Corporation. Prior to this, Ambassador Dobbins was a longtime member of the State Department, serving with the Foreign Service in notable positions, including Assistant Secretary of State for Europe, Special Assistant to the President for the Western Hemisphere, Special Advisor to the President and Secretary of State for the Balkans, and Ambassador to the European Community. Ambassador Dobbins has directly served the presidential administrations of Barack Obama, George W. Bush, and Bill Clinton, either as a crisis manager, diplomat, or special envoy. Ambassador Dobbins' career has spanned five decades and taken him around the world to locations like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kosovo, Bosnia, Haiti, and Somalia. Our discussion tonight is the distinguished ambassador, Gion Walker. Ambassador Walker is the former US ambassador to the Czech Republic from 1995 to 1998. She served as President Clinton's key advisor on U.S. relations with Europe on the National Security Council staff. She's also recipient of the Distinguished Civil Servant Award for her works on arms control in the State Department, which she received from President Ronald Reagan. She has also served as a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Ambassador Walker now serves as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the American Academy of Diplomacy. She also sits on the boards of several organizations, such as the German Marshall Fund of the US, the Project on Ethic, Ethnic Relations, Friends of Czech Greenways, the American Friends of the Czech Republic, and the Washington Concert Opera. We're very fortunate not to have one, but two distinguished ambassadors at our podium tonight. And I ask that you join me in giving them a warm World Affairs Council DC welcome. Thank you. Well, am I doing this right? Perfect. Uh, Jim Dobbins has more experience in conflict resolution and post-conflict, efforts at post-conflict rebuilding than any other living American. And I'm sure we're going to want to spend most of the evening on places like Haiti, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, Bosnia. But I'd like to begin by, asking, by taking just a few minutes on another effort of his or involvement of his in giving, helping give a nation a new start much earlier in his career, the unif unification of Germany after the collapse of communism, which among other issues figures in his book. 
that was not an issue where there were parties who hated each other and might want to kill each other and had to be reconciled. While there were resentments and tensions, most East Germans were only too delighted to be taken over by the West Germans. But it took real diplomatic skill to unite Germany in a way that minimized as much as possible the alarm not only of Russia, but of Germany's West European neighbors at the prospect of a much bigger and potentially richer and more powerful Germany. It was a huge success and took real diplomatic school skill. And I wonder, Jim, if in retrospect, uh, you see anything we might have done differently or more to make the outcome even better, not primarily for Germany, but for broader European stability? Well, I think, I mean, that was a, that was a momentous era in which we were definitely swimming with the tide of history. Um, uh, I, I, I think, you know, in retrospect, a lot of credit goes, first of all, to uh, Reagan and Schultz uh, in the period before um, uh, George H.W. Bush took office in preparing the ground. Um, and then uh, with uh, George H.W. Bush, who was probably the best prepared president we've had in the 20th century, um, someone who'd served as uh, head of the CIA, ambassador to China, vice president for eight years. I mean, the, 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 his, his, his curriculum vitae was really uh, unexcelled. Uh, and the team he brought, particularly Jim Baker and Brent Scowcroft. Um, but uh, as, I, as I now read some of the histories of that period in which we can see more clearly what was going on on the other side of the so-called Iron Curtain, um, and what was going on within the Kremlin, it, it's clear that, that a lot of the credit belongs to Mikhail Gorbachev and a cadre of very progressive advisors that he had uh, gathered around him. Um, and that, uh, and that uh, a lot of the credit for this era passing so peacefully um, and, uh, and so positively in most respects um, uh, really uh, uh, is a credit to him. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, looking back on our experience, the difficulties weren't difficulties between the two Germanys. Um, they worked out their differences pretty quickly. The differences were, um, uh, first of all, differences between Washington and, uh, and Moscow and between uh, Bonn and Moscow over whether or not Germany would remain uh, once united in NATO, which was the, the main sticking point in the in the year-long negotiating process. Um, uh, Gorbachev was ready to concede German unification almost immediately, the, the wall went down, um, but attached some conditions to it that we found unacceptable. Um, and, uh, and, and in fact, uh, I think uh, uh, Maggie Thatcher and, and Francois Mitterrand were more bitter opponents of uh, German unification than, uh, than was um, Mikhail Gorbachev. So, there was a good deal of intra-alliance um, work to be done to smooth through, smooth over the process. Um, I, I think that uh, it, it, in terms of what we could have done better, I'm not sure there really was, it was, it was an almost perfect, I think, example of American leadership, skillful diplomacy, um, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, the, the employment of, uh, of close personal confidential relationships among uh, world leaders that produced the result. Now, uh, we did uh, in those periods, both Helmut Kohl and, and also American leaders and Carter Jim Baker, um, did pretty much pretty clearly indicate to Gorbachev that we had no intention of expanding NATO eastward, that NATO, NATO would not move into East Germany uh, or into anywhere else in Eastern Europe. And, uh, the Russians, who were preoccupied, their country was falling apart under them, never got those assurances in writing. Um, and, um, and as a result, um, over, the, over the following uh, 15 years or so, uh, NATO did expand significantly into the Warsaw Pact and, in fact, into the former Soviet Union um, in ways that, uh, over time, antagonized Russia um, and uh, created a, a new hostility and a new... Uh, and, and a new um, conflict uh, 
between uh, the West and, and Russia, which we're living with today. Um, and I think uh, it was unfortunate, I think, that we didn't clarify our intentions and stick to them uh, earlier on. Are there, are there any lessons from the German experience that are applicable or likely to be applicable in the future, or was it so completely one-off that one could never expect anything similar to occur? Well, the, the, the most ana analogous situation in a sense, of course, is the two Koreas, which like the two Germanys were separated as a result of World War II into what was considered temporary disarmament zones um, uh, uh, pending uh, unification, which was in both cases expected to come fairly quickly once there was a peace agreement. Um, in, in Korea, of course, it turned into a, a much more violent conflict than occurred in post-war Germany. Um, and uh, we're in this odd situation today where uh, the Korean War, which started in 1951 and uh, has not ended, um, we signed an armistice in 1953, um, which stopped the fighting, uh, but which and which anticipated that there would be a peace settlement, a, a political settlement, um, in the near future, and that's never occurred. And of course, that uh, uh, Korea today remains probably the most dangerous and intense flashpoint uh, in the world. Um, I, I think the analogy of the two Koreas is only goes so far. Um, the conditions are very different. I don't see unification occurring in the manner it occurred with respect to Germany, that peacefully, that consensually, um, uh, and with the blessing of all the neighbors. Um, but I do think there are some uh, analogies. For instance, uh, in 19... Uh, I, can't, I think 1970, trying to think 89, sorry, about 1975, the quadripartite agreement was reached um, in which finally the United States uh, and the other Western countries recognized East Germany, opened embassies in East Germany, normalized relations with East Germany, and yet at the same time continued to proclaim that West Germany was the only legitimate successor to the Reich and to the German Empire. Uh, and and would be the basis of a reunified Germany. So we managed to have our cake and eat it too. And um, I think at some stage a formula something like that might well be used to normalize relations with North Korea. Moving on to the, uh, the hot spots you've dealt with. In an earlier book called America's Role in Nation Building, you make, I find, a very persuasive case uh, for the, the, the number of stabilization or peacekeeping forces in a post-conflict situation, the ratio of the, of the peacekeeping forces to the population has an important influence on the likely success. Uh, that just the intimida intimidating factor, I think you use the word intimidation, of having the force can often keep potential troublemakers more or less at bay, more rather than less. What if that doesn't work? And you also talk, of course, about the importance of the relationship between the military providing security and the civilian efforts to reconstruct a society and a government, and the civilian efforts, rather, a society, a government, uh, an economy. You know, what if that doesn't work? Uh, you and I worked on Bosnia at different times. Mm -hmm. When I was involved in Bosnia in the first 18 months or so of the Clinton administration, uh, there was a UN so-called peacekeeping force that stood by and watched attacks on uh, by Serbs on Bosnian civilian centers. Uh, the UN tradition at that time was that peacekeepers had to remain neutral, which included being neutral between the attackers and the victims of an attack. Uh, I think we've come a long way since then. The, uh, I think it was Kofi Annan from the United Nations who said that uh, sometimes diplomacy without force is impotent. 
But what is your sin? Of course, on the other hand, if a stabilization force or a peacekeeping force does take military action against an aggressor, it loses its neutrality and maybe loses its ability to operate. Uh, are there any guiding principles you see from your very mixed career in situations like this? Well, I think, I mean, I mean one of the principles is that more is better. Um, more money, more time, uh, and uh, more personnel generally produces better results than less. That's that's kind of obvious, um, uh, and uh, but I think that it, uh, I, I think the experience indicates that. I mean, I, I think the Clinton administration went through a learning process over its eight years. Um, uh, in in Somalia, it uh, it entered office drastically reducing the number of American troops that George H.W. Bush had, had deployed while expanding their mission. So Bush had deployed 20,000 American troops with a mission of uh, overseeing the delivery of humanitarian assistance, food and medicine, no, no nation building, no political objective, just humanitarian assistance in the midst of a famine. Uh, Clinton reduced the force from 20,000 Americans to 1,200 Americans and gave it the, uh, the mission of supporting a UN-led um, uh, democratization campaign that was going to antagonize every warlord in the country. And this mismatch between soaring ambition and plummeting capabilities quickly caught up with us. You had the Black Hawk Down incident and, and we left a few months later. Um, uh, I, I think that, that the Clinton administration learned from that lesson, uh, did a better job in Haiti uh, two years later, put in a more substantial force, but it again uh, put a time limit on that, uh, on that deployment um, and said that we were going to stay long enough to uh, ensure that a new president was elected, that new mayors and a new legislature were elected, and then we were going to leave. And so uh, we achieved all our objectives in a two-year period we took no casualties. It looked like a, a, a perfect operation in which every objective had been achieved and at, 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 uh, at no cost in blood, and not much cost in money. Um, and yet uh, the United States invaded Haiti again 10 years later in 2004 because, uh, because the two-year period we'd been there just wasn't long enough to affect the changes that would be substantial enough to make another in intervention unnecessary. So by the time the, the Clinton had got to Bosnia, you know, he still hadn't learned not to set a deadline. He went into Bosnia saying we were going to be out in a year, but he had learned not to keep his promise. And at the end of the year, uh, he, he, he announced that we hadn't achieved a number of objectives and we were going to stay until we did. And we stayed for 10 years um, and left in 2005 and turned it over to a UN, to a European Union peacekeeping force, which is there to, to, to today. So. 20, however many years it is since then, 22 years later, there's still a peacekeeping force in Bosnia. It's just a few hundred people. It's not very difficult. It's not very expensive or demanding, but uh, it, it, it helps keep the country together. Um, uh, and, and by the time you got to Kosovo, um, uh, this was the fourth intervention we had done. It was the second intervention that NATO had done, and uh, we'd gotten better at it over time, and in all of those interventions, except the first one, deploying an overwhelming force that would discourage the emergence of a violent resistance movement just by its size and capacity uh, was an important component of the, of the deployment. You then got to the uh, Bush administration, uh, George W. Bush. He and his party had been in opposition throughout the 90s. Um, the job of the opposition is to oppose, and the Republicans had comprehensively opposed all of the Clinton's interventions, whether they were successful or not, um, uh, just on principle, um, and, uh, and came into, and, and campaigned on a no more nation building platform. Um, in the four and a half hours of debate between um, Al Gore and uh, George Bush uh, in the 2000 election, um, uh, the only foreign policy issue that came up, the only national security came, issue that came up was nation building. And George Bush promised he wasn't going to do any more nation building. 
Um, uh, you can think what a happy time this must have been that four and a half hours of debate between two presidential candidates and the only foreign policy issue that uh, they thought worth raising was nation building uh, in Bosnia and Kosovo principally. So they came into office, uh, you know, committed not to do this anymore. And then, of course, Bush invaded three new countries in his first three years in office. So he invaded uh, Afghanistan in 2001. Um, Iraq in 2003, and we went back into Haiti in 2004. Now, we turned Haiti quickly over to the UN, and so we didn't get involved in a long-term mission in Haiti. But in uh, Bosnia and, uh, and in, sorry, in Afghanistan and Iraq, we did. But we approached it completely different from the Clinton administration. The Bush administration was determined to do nothing that Bill Clinton had done. Whatever he'd done, it was wrong. They weren't going to do it. And so Don Rumsfeld um, in uh, op-eds and speeches explained that uh, the Clinton administration by flooding and, and its allies by flooding Bosnia and Kosovo with international military manpower and economic assistance had turned those two societies into permanent wards of the international community. And we were going to avoid this by minimizing those commitments in Afghanistan and Iraq by making an absolute minimum commitment of manpower and economic assistance. Rumsfeld was essentially uh, transferring the American domestic debate about welfare reform in the 1990s to the international realm. And it couldn't have been a more inapt analogy. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the minimal deployments uh, uh, in both countries, we had less troops in Afghanistan throughout the first year there than we have there today, um, uh, for instance. And in Iraq, as soon as the statue fell in Baghdad, we began withdrawing troops. Despite the lesson in Afghan uh, Kosovo and, and Bosnia that you needed many more troops to stabilize a country than you did to force entry. Um, uh, and so the result was that you created a, a vacuum, a vacuum, a power, a vacuum of power. Uh, you created an opportunity for, uh, uh, for uh, opposition elements to organize, to arm, to train, to, to get funding, to find foreign sanctuaries, and to uh, create a violent resistance movement with which you were going to have to deal. And so a policy in which you reinforce only under defeat, in which you make additional commitments only once the initial commitments have been shown to be inadequate, turned out to be a vastly more expensive way of approaching these kinds of missions. If we had applied the kinds of force and the, kind, the volume of assistance and, and, and military commitment in, in Iraq in 2003 that we did apply in 2008, you know, we would have been much more successful as we were in 2008. And the same is true in Afghanistan. If we had applied the kind of commitment in Afghanistan of money and, and, and manpower in 2001 when we initially went in, that we eventually did in 2010 um, when, when we surged there, again, we would have had a much a uh, more positive outcome, I think, in both cases. So those were the lessons that I drew from those experiences. What about uh, inter UN peacekeepers and the actually using force to, in to keep the peace if necessary? If, it's, if the overwhelming preponderance of force doesn't discourage troublemakers? Well, I, I mean, the UN has, First of all, I mean, UN has had a, uh, a number of quite successful peacekeeping missions. Um, uh, this was particularly true through the uh, through the 90s um, and into the and into the beginning of the next decade. Uh, the peak of civil wars um, in the 20th century came um, actually uh, at at the end of the Cold War. Um, uh, these wars had been fostered by uh, by superpower competition in places like like Afghanistan, like like El Salvador, uh, like Nicaragua, um, like Mozambique, um, like Angola, where uh, the Soviet Union and the United States had just poured gasoline on the uh, local uh, conflicts, um, and with the end of the Cold War, um, the the. Uh, the U.S., uh, Washington and Moscow could cooperate in brokering peace settlements and the U.N. could go in and oversee the implementation of those peace settlements. Um, Cambodia was another case. Uh, 
Um, and, uh, and so this was a very successful formula, but it did depend on there being a peace to keep, that the sides had agreed to a peace, but they just didn't trust each other enough to actually implement the disarmament and the other conditions that, that they had agreed to and probably wouldn't implement them unless there was a, a neutral third party with the capacity to compel both sides to live up to what it had agreed to. And that's a, that's a very successful formula and it continues to be successful today in a number of cases where those circumstances can be met. But the UN has taken on in recent years a number of operations which are closer to counterinsurgency operations than peacekeeping in which there isn't an agreement uh, in which the parties haven't uh, concluded uh, uh, that, the, that they're better off uh, not fighting. Um, and in which they're trying to compel a peace and, and, and secure a, 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 an innocent population. And the UN is not well equipped for this. Um, in the aftermath of the disappointments, um, uh, particularly in Afghanistan and Iraq, but also the uh, disappointing UN effort in Bosnia, which preceded the uh, NATO-led effort, um, Western Europe, the United States, and Canada all withdrew from UN peacekeeping. So UN peacekeeping is paid for by the rich countries, but uh, peacekeepers are all from poor countries. Um, and, uh, and they simply don't have the equipment, the training, um, uh, and uh, the capacity that, uh, that the rich countries could bring to an operation like the NATO operations in Bosnia and Kosovo. And so, uh, and so they face uh, and, and they often don't have, again, the problems of scale. In a country like Bosnia, we deployed, NATO deployed 60,000 troops for a country of three million people. In Kosovo, you had a country of two million people, most of whom were wildly friendly to NATO, um, and we deployed 50,000 troops. Uh, so you've got a country like the Congo, I can't remember the population, I think it's like 60 million people, um, so it's 20 times bigger, and you've got a force that's a third the size. I mean, it's like 20,000, 20,000 UN, UN peacekeepers in a country of something like 60 million people. You know, so, so, so the, it's a wildly disparate um, ratio of force to population, which explains why these missions are so difficult um, and why the, the effects are so limited. So a lot depends on the, on, on the circumstances in which these missions are are conducted and even the missions that uh, don't entirely succeed generally are better than nothing. Um, uh, and, uh, and one of the, we did a study which admittedly looked mostly at the missions in the 90s and early part of this century rather than the more difficult ones, but it looked at 20 missions which were pretty much the totality of missions that had occurred up to that period about 2005. Um, and uh, 15 of them were successful in the most fundamental sense, that is, the place 10 years after the peacekeepers got there was peaceful. And after all, peace is what peacekeeping is all about. And so if you leave behind a society that's at peace with itself and its neighbors, you've done what you came to do. But in almost all those cases, they were, also, they were better governed uh, and they were more prosperous. Um, we looked at, you know, there's the World Bank and the and the uh, UN Development Program and the Freedom House and uh, each do annual indices, which they rate every country in the world on a kind of a one to 10 scale for Freedom House, how democratic they are, World Bank, how well governed they are, UNDP, the, the Human Development Index, which is a combination of health and education and some other f criteria, and IMF, of course, on the GDP. And what we showed was that, that the results of these operations, all 20 of them really, even the ones that hadn't succeeded in, in restoring peace, had improved governments, had improved the GDP, had improved human development, and had, and had improved democratization. Obviously from very low bases, um, so they were still poor and poorly governed, but they weren't as poor or as poorly governed as they had been. So I'm not suggesting that even the the most difficult of these missions isn't worth doing, but, uh, but, but there are very few of them that have the scale of the resources that we're, we were able to adopt to the most successful of the missions. I don't want to give the impression that Jim's a militarist at all. He gives equal attention 
to the civilian side of reconstruction and rehabilitation, uh, including putting governments together. And he's, he's not a fan of rushing to immediate national elections. I wonder if you'd elaborate a bit on what you think the groundwork needs to be to get to that point. Sorry, to... to you're not a fan of immediate national elections. Oh, uh, I mean, I, you know, I mean, that you're, if, you're, if you're trying to stabilize a country that's emerging from a conflict, um, in many cases, y there is no government or the government that exists has been so discredited by virtue of its behavior and the conflict that you just ended that you can't easily work with it and, you can and, and it has no local legitimacy. And so you do have to um, put in place over time a, a government that has legitimacy with the population that is representative um, uh, and, that, and that will be accepted both by the international community and the local population. And, and really the elections are the only way we know how to do that. Um, there are isolated cases, I can only really think of one, where a pre-existing non-democratic regime retains the legitimacy and the popularity and the respectability so that you can just reimpose it. I mean, Kuwait is an example of that. So Saddam invades Kuwait, we throw him out, we turn Kuwait back to the royal family, and the emir gives us $5 billion, and everyone's happy, and nobody says anything about why didn't you, why didn't you make it democratic. The Kuwaitis are happy to have their emir back, we're happy to have $5 billion, and Saddam out. And so is everybody else. But, but there are very few cases where there's a pre-existing legitimate authority that you can simply reimpose. And so elections really are the only way that you can construct something um, that, uh, uh, and so you do eventually have to have them. Um, but um, the, the quicker you go to elections, um, the, the less prepared you're going to be, the more likely it is that the parties that were uh, responsible for the conflict um, uh, and that retain the political networks uh, and the loyalty uh, that is often based on ethnic or religious grounds of the of the uh, contenders for power that uh, that had given rise to the conflict will continue to dominate the politics, uh, and you'll rep and you'll replicate that uh, that conflictual arrangement, albeit perhaps in a somewhat more peaceful uh, circumstances in in the government that results. So, so there is a a balance between how quickly you move, um, and how. Uh, and how much time you allow for the situation to develop. And I, I don't know that there's a, an easy formula for it, um, but I do know that the international community, uh, or even the United States, as an example in Iraq, you know, doesn't, doesn't govern foreign countries very well. We're not structured for it. We don't have a colonial service. We, it, we, if, it, if, if, if countries had, a ta had that talent, they don't have it anymore. Uh, and so, um, and so, there is a certain priority to moving toward elections, even in societies that are not fully prepared for it. You've talked about starting with local elections before national elections, which may be possible in some instances. And what you did in in Afghanistan, one of Jim's terrific books is called After the Taliban. It's short, doesn't take much time to read. It's super about putting together the first. Afghanistan government after the American the Americans overthrew the Taliban, um, but in that situation it was possible to put together an interim government without elections that that included all the different ethnic and other major factions. Was that simply because of Af Afghanistan's particular culture, or is it something that might be done elsewhere? Well, the government the government was a an interim government. Uh, it was intended to last just six months until there was a constitution and a progress toward elections. Um, uh, and it, it, uh, it did occur under somewhat unique circumstances. It, occurred, it was just after 9-11. The U.S. had supported uh, opposition elements to the Taliban who had been battling um, the Taliban for most of a decade. Uh, uh, with the assistance of Russia, Iran, and India. So the, the popular impression in this country is that 
In the aftermath of 9-11, we put together a coalition and overthrew the Taliban, but the fact is we joined an existing coalition which consisted of Russia, Iran, India, and the, and the Northern Alliance, and they overthrew the Taliban with the help of American air power. Um, so there was a force on the ground, um, it, uh, and when the Taliban fell and the country was liberated, there were only three or 400 Americans in the country. Um, uh, uh, so it, it wasn't at all an Iraqi-style invasion. We, we had broad international backing. We had a UN mandate in favor of the intervention. We had the UN uh, that organized the conference to put together uh, an interim government for Afghanistan so that we wouldn't have to occupy and govern it for this period, which the Bush administration was keen not to do. Um, the, the government was pretty broadly representative of all of the ethnic and uh, uh, and religious and uh, uh, and linguistic groups in the country, but it didn't include the Taliban, um, uh, uh, and um, uh, which was which was a, a definite problem as it developed over time. Um, but but the UN uh, and that government were successful in uh, creating a constitutional convention, adopting a constitution and ultimately holding elections, which elected Hamid Karzai, who had been chosen in this earlier meeting as the chairman of the interim government as the new president of, of Afghanistan. So politically, I think that was a very smooth transition um, uh, and, and worked very successfully. Um, in the longer term, however, um, trying to exclude a major patronage network and interest group in a country permanently from power and influence um, uh, is very difficult and creates uh, uh, the prospect of renewed conflict as occurred uh, in Afghanistan. I don't think we could have invited the Taliban to the Bonn conference just a few weeks after 9-11. It, it occurred in late November of 2000, uh, 2001. Um, uh, passions were too high. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the Taliban and we were still fighting uh, in Afghanistan when the conference took place. But there were opportunities shortly thereafter to bring Taliban leadership uh, into the political process. Many of them uh, offered to surrender. Some of them did surrender and we sent them to Guantanamo or, um, or other prisons for uh, years uh, before we released them. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and the, the decision to exclude them was a major problem. And, and we faced somewhat the same problem in Iraq. You know, we, the, you know the, one of the lessons of successful nation building is you need to co-opt the, the contending factions into some kind of peaceful form of co competition. And when you try to exclude one of them uh, permanently from power, from wealth, from competition, you know, you're creating uh, an antibody, and we did the same thing in Iraq, of course, with the Ba'ath Party, um, uh, and so and so that was a problem. The clock says it's time for us to uh, open this up to questions from the floor. I want to turn to the training of foreign service officers. You obviously uh, have done an extraordinary. Uh, array of things in your career, <clears throat> but there is something, as you know, called the Foreign Service Institute, which I've actually recently written about. And I'm curious as to how you think American diplomats can best be trained to handle these complex conflict situations and acquire some of the insight that you've garnered over your long career as they start out and perhaps miss making some mistakes that uh, some wisdom would have prevented them from doing. You mean in addition to reading my books? Yes. yes. Uh, well, um, I mean, I, I think that, I think the Foreign Service now has acquired a number of these skills. I mean, we've been engaged uh, at such a high volume for so long, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan, but in a number of other um, failed, failing, fragile states, um, that there's a whole component of the Foreign Service. Uh, in fact, most of the Foreign Service have had at least one or two assignments in countries like that by now. Um, and, and there's a cadre that do it repeatedly. 
Um, so I think that the people who are used to liaising with the U.S. and, and, and international military, um, doing things like police training, penal reform, justice sector reform, um, uh, countering violent extremism, um, supporting uh, improved governance. I mean, these are skills which the, the Foreign Service, if you include, particularly if you include the US, Foreign Service and USAID, um, have developed. Now, I think there is, we're now in a sort of no more nation building phase, um, uh, a reaction against the frustrations with Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's possible that we'll lose some of those, um, uh, some, of the, some of that capability. Um, certainly, uh, you know, I mean, the, the military went through this after Vietnam. The military had gotten rather good at counterinsurgency after a decade in Vietnam, and in fact had bought, largely defeated the insurgency. Vietnam fell to a conventional attack from North Vietnam after the Viet Cong had officially been defeated um, in 1973. Or 75, I guess. Um, the uh, uh, but but the experience was dramatic, and so the military decided they weren't going to do counterinsurgency anymore, and so they took it out of all of their manuals, um, and they took it out of the curriculum and all of the military education uh, schools, and essentially forgot how to do it, and and spent the first three or four years in Iraq, you know, rediscovering this particular form of operations. And so it's possible that we would go through the same thing um, if there's a long enough period during which we're simply not engaged in these kinds of activities. Um, uh, and I, I do think that there's a role for the Foreign Service Institute, uh, although, although frankly, the, unlike the military, the, 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 the State Department doesn't invest heavily in formal education. Um, most, most education occurs you know, in the workshop, um, and uh, and I don't think that's likely to change. I mean, the military is an institution that's designed to prepare for contingencies, um, and the U.S. is and the State Department is an institution designed to operate on you know on a daily basis like a police force. Uh, my question pertains to China, uh, yeah. because uh, I'm getting the sense that, and I'm sure you're aware that China. Uh, may be undoing a lot of the, uh, uh, or reversing a lot of the accomplishments you've achieved, you know, uh, obviously in the Bonn conference in 2001 and as envoy to pres for President Obama to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, do you think China, by including itself and involving itself more in Afghan affairs these days, uh, do you think that they're reversing and undoing a lot of your achievements? No, not, I, I don't. Not, not as respect to Afghanistan. First of all, I think it's important to, to note that China, among the, among the permanent members of the Security Council, China is the largest contributor to UN peacekeeping. Um, and that, and that, that's, of course, a big change. A decade ago, they weren't a contributor at all. Uh, and now they're the largest contributor of the, of the permanent members of the Security Council. Um, I, I, when I was back in the State Department in 2013 and 14 doing Afghanistan, I worked regularly with the Chinese, um, and I, I think our interests largely converged. I mean, they, they were an economic uh, investor in Afghanistan, and they needed security to realize their investment. They're very worried about Muslim extremism in their own society, um, and, uh, and, and, saw the, and, and saw the danger of Afghanistan again becoming a locus for regional uh, extremists to congregate and uh, and uh, operate from, um, and in general, while the China to the uh, to you know China looking in the direction of uh, of of of, uh, um, of the Pacific is a competitor to the United States. If you look China and the other you know looking toward Central Asia, it's a competitor with Russia for influence in Kazakhstan. Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, but not particularly with the United States. Um, and in Afghanistan, and even in Pakistan, uh, our interests largely converged in my view. I was intrigued by your first question and the end of your answer to the first question, uh, which is, uh, uh, because I think it's an important question today, is how far we should have gone at the end of the Cold War and how justified Putin is in responding to 
Uh, my own view is that, uh, you know, Western Europe has been as much of a threat during the Cold War and today as Canada is to us. And Putin, with his excellent intelligence service, knows this. Um, so w how far should we have gone? Uh, uh, Ukraine, too f uh, uh, a country too far? Um, I, I mean, it's a good question. And I think the, and my view has shifted from, you know, over the years, uh, depending on events and also depending on what my responsibilities were from one time to another. Um, I, I can remember at the end of the George H.W. Bush administration, after the Soviet Union had collapsed, there was some debate within uh, the administration um, about whether or not uh, the former members of the Warsaw Pact should be considered potential members of NATO. Um, and I uh, opposed uh, that at the time. Um, I was in charge of the European Bureau at that point. Um, and I did that because my view was that the only country in Europe that could threaten the United States was Russia. Even with the Soviet Union gone, Russia still had its complete nu nuclear arsenal. And so it was the only country that, was threat that could threaten the United States. And it didn't want to threaten the United States. It was very friendly. It, it wanted as close a relationship as possible back in those, those early uh, months and years of the post-Soviet world. And so why antagonize it? Why drive it into a corner? Why isolate it, which you were going to do? Because it was too big and indigestible to take into NATO or into the European Union. That was never going to happen. And so if everybody else became a member, so what that meant that Europe was divided into NATO countries, NATO potential countries, and Russia. And that's what you were left with. Um, and so I was opposed to it. Uh, I then went off and did other things for most of the rest of the decade. Uh, it wasn't part of the debate. The, the first NATO enlargement took place and took uh, Czechoslovakia and Poland and Hungary in. Um, and uh, I think the argument at the time was that, the, that you know, Yugoslavia was falling apart. The, the Balkans were descending into conflict. And there was a worry that Eastern Europe would also become prey to the old nationalist tensions uh, that had uh, that had racked uh, Europe uh, before the Second World War and before the First World War if these countries were left untethered and that therefore they needed to be given a home. Um, and certainly the promise of NATO and European integration was a powerful factor in consolidating democracy in these countries uh, and in promoting the kind of market uh, economic reforms which allowed them to qualify for membership in both organizations. Then uh, a decade later in the, in the late 90s, I was again in charge of the European Bureau. At this point, we had been in Bosnia for several years. We had just conducted an air campaign and deployed forces in Kosovo. Um, and there were several other conflicts in the Balkans that were rearing their head, um, uh, including Montenegro and Macedonia. and. And you could see just sort of endless conflict in this region. And so my view was that we probably had to apply the same formula for the Balkans that we had applied for uh, Northeastern Europe uh, and offer the prospect of NATO and European membership to these countries in order to provide them the incentives to restructure their economies and their polities uh, uh, and, and, and again, give them a home. Um, I was more... Uh, skeptical about bringing in the three Baltic states because they were not only former, they weren't former members of the Warsaw Pact, they were former parts of the Soviet Union. And before that, they had been former parts of the Russian Empire for several hundred years. Um, and they were also indefensible given their geographic location. Um, and so I was concerned about that. Finland had been perfectly happy and neutral and safe for, uh, for you know, for 70 years at that point, why couldn't the Baltic states enjoy the same status? Um, but I also cautioned my European colleagues that the, the political price of entry for the Baltic, Balkan states in NATO in the United States Congress was going to be the Baltic states because the Baltic states had strong domestic constituents in the United States and, and Bulgaria and Romania had none. 
And so you weren't going to get Bulgaria and Romania in unless you accepted the Baltic states. And so that's how that occurred. And, and I think in retrospect, that was, that was probably a mistake, but, it was, but, the, but the Russians actually accepted, even under Putin, uh, accepted that with good grace. It was when uh, we began pushing Ukraine and Georgia um, for UN membership uh, under George W. Bush um, that, uh, that they began to push back, first conducting a military campaign in Georgia, um, uh, ad admittedly provoked by the Georgians, but still. Um, and, uh, and then when the European Union uh, offered the Ukraine a deal which precluded its accepting a comparable deal from the Russian trade, uh, uh, trade agreement, um, and effectively anchored it in the West, the Russians reacted again. Um, and I think Ukraine was definitely one country too far, and, and Georgia as well. How do you reconcile the idealistic view that the U.S. often projects towards democracy with the more pragmatic reality of what the world looks like today, where in many of the countries where we are suggesting democracy might be appropriate at some time. The results of democracy would be extremely negative in all likelihood towards the United States. And it seems as though we send mixed messages, like in Egypt, for example, where are we supporting a cooperative regime or are we in favor of idealistic thoughts that may have a very negative pragmatic consequences? Well, I don't think it's generally true that, 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 that democratic regimes are going to be hostile to the United States. And I think it's also true that, um, that, that we were very successful in promoting uh, democracy, not as the sole or, or even necessarily the most important aspect of American foreign policy at any particular moment, but as, a, as, a, as an element of American foreign policy. So if you look at, at the trend of, of, of events uh, and, and developments in the world from, say, the 1970 uh, through 2010, approximately, 2005, um, you had an explosion of democracy. In Europe, you had Spain, Portugal, Greece, uh, and uh, Turkey, all of which were dictatorships, all of which became functioning democracies, and most of which were quite pro-American as a result. Um, uh, every government in Latin America except Cuba was democratic under the Clinton administration. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, just to be clear, I think uh, I was focused primarily on uh, the Middle East and the Muslim well, population. Well, I'll get, I'll get yeah. to the Middle East because yeah, clearly, um, you know, it's a counterexample. So, so you had all of, all of Latin America move, you know, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, they were all dictatorships. They're all democracies and they're all pro-American. More or less. I mean, they're, they're certainly as pro-American or better than their dictatorship predecessors were. Uh, uh, most of Asia is democratic, except obviously with respect to China. And again, most most of the democracies are pro-American. Um, so, uh, so, I, so I, I think it's important not to generalize from our experience in the Middle East and the, and the disappointments with the Arab Spring and the failure of those democratic movements to to flower. Um, uh, I, I, and I don't know that that had they uh, had they had they come to fruition, they would have necessarily been anti-American. Um, uh, Tunisia is 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 one that's still struggling, but still moving in a democratic direction rather than the contrary. And it's not a, it's not um, anti-American. Um, I do think that uh, that that in fragile societies. Brittle societies like those that have not enjoyed change, that have been rigid for a long time. When change comes, it can be, uh, uh, it, it it can shatter the society rather than create the kind of evolution that we had hoped for. Um, and I don't have a, a particular formula for the Middle East. I, w I was hopeful that uh, that the Arab Spring would bring democratic change of the sort we'd seen everywhere else in the world. And my argument at the time was, it's happened everywhere else. Why shouldn't it happen in the Middle East? Well, it didn't, for at least not yet, and not in most of the places. Um, 
Uh, and I think that uh, the formula of invading countries in order to make them democratic clearly had a lot of you know, counterproductive effects and, um, and wasn't what we'd done in most of these other places. Um, so I, I think you're right that, um, you know, that, that the Middle East has been an exception to an otherwise general trend. Now, since, since about 2005 or so, there's been some rescission, and countries like Turkey, for instance, that were democratic have begun to become less democratic. Philippines is another example. There are several examples. Um, but the trend is still, you know, you, you, went, you went from having maybe in the, in the first half of the 20th century, even up to 1970, say, you know, maybe there were 30, 35 democracies in the world and all the rest was autocracies. And by 2005, you were up to over 100. Um, uh, and the minority were still authoritarian. Uh, and, and it's still, the, the bulk of the world is either fully democratic or at least partially democratic uh, today. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.